In fact, he was saying it, and I love it, that everybody gets to fulfill the Great Commission. Everybody, not just men and not just women, not just priests or not just pastors, not just, you know, pop. No, no, everybody. That means if you work at a salon, if you're a mom running a daycare, if you are running a corporation, if you, I mean, wherever you are on the earth, you have been ordained and anointed to fulfill the Great Commission. And without you, we do not get, <laughs> we do not get the fullness of the kingdom. We need you. Hi, welcome to Havila's Podcast. I'm your host, Havila Cunnington. And if you're new here, you should subscribe. We've been having these, well, we do a series. And we had a lot of feedback last month about the art of adult friendships. You should go back and watch that. And the goal is to have conversations that we want to have to answer questions that we have, but also to center it around Christ, to center it around faith, that we don't just take what culture says, but we actually acknowledge that God has the final say in our lives and we want him to define how we do life. And that doesn't just mean in our faith walk, but in our everyday life. So I'm hoping that we are, we're giving you content that helps you, well, helps uncomplicate things. And I hope that it empowers you to live that life that you want to live for God in your life, in your friendships, in your family, and in your ministry. So this month, we're jumping into a series called Women in Leadership. Women in Leadership. I've never done a series like this, and I think it's partly because, well, there's a lot of opinions about women in leadership. And I think one of the number one questions I've received over, gosh, 25 years of ministry is, should women lead? And what does the Bible say about women in leadership? And, you know, is there, is it against what God said? I mean, I, I, I constantly, and I, I've had so many times that there have been people that have walked up to me with their Bible and said, explain this verse. And because I, I think that there are, I think there are people that are really gifted to advocate and go deep and go into the theological conversation I knew that I was ill-equipped for that, and so I often would recommend a book or recommend that they talk to so-and-so or they watch this podcast, and that's kind of where I would leave it. Um, and so when it, we started talking as a team about doing this series, I thought, oh, I don't know if I'm that girl, but I'm realizing that there's this, there's this chasm that's happening in the church where it's not so much should women be leading, but how should women be leading, and maybe answering a bigger question than just should women be leading and more about what was the purpose of God for women on the earth. And I think that's a much better conversation. So today I want to answer some of your questions. Again, these are just touch points. You can dive deeper into all of this. There are books written on this topic. But I really, I don't know, I find that we as humans complicate things, specifically as Americans. If you're internationally watching this, you might not as much. But we all have opinions about things. We like to say, but what about this? And But what about that? And I think it's better to go back to the basics, to just go, okay, let's stop adding this and adding that, and let's go back to the Bible, let's go back to Jesus, let's go back to what is going to help us. And I hope that this clarifies some of it for you, and you know, we'll go from there. So one of the questions that I get consistently as a woman in leadership, and if you're a woman in leadership, specifically in the church, not necessarily in the corporate world, but in the church, you might get asked the question, should women, or do I believe that women should be leading? I think I'm, I think the idea that I'm positioning women as we have a right to lead is very different than should women be leading because leadership, and I think we get kind of confused on this, that leadership is on a mic with a platform making decisions. But according to scripture, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you have to be a servant. That's what a leader is. It's a leader is those that serve. They're the ones that are doing it ahead of you and showing you how to do it right. And so, yeah, there is the fivefold ministry and there's different gifts and graces in that space. The Bible says we're all to be leaders. We're all to be, to set an example in how we live and to show others how to live a life of, well, being a Christ follower, but also somebody who answers questions and solves problems according to the Bible with others. So do I think that women should be leading? Yes. Why? I think everyone should be a servant. Everyone should be leading as a servant. And also, I think that women are critical to the culture of faith. I think there is no healthy family 
without having a mother and a father. And I get that, you know, well, they're single moms and they're single dads. Yes. The holistic part of a biblical family is a mom and a dad. And both of them have their own strength, their own weaknesses, and their own really, really characteristics and qualities that God created in them that brought them together. You know, in the Bible, when in Genesis, it talks about that God created man, it wasn't necessarily that he was, had all the attributes of a man, although he did, it was really mankind. It was really a person that he created. And when he created Eve as the helper, it wasn't that he, that she was created. And again, you'll have to go deeper in this, that she was created as just to be a helper to make sure Adam could do what he needed to do. It was that she was going to coexist with him simultaneously, but be the other side, like a coin where she would serve God and he would serve God and together they would serve him holistically. So she would be the other side to leadership. And so, yeah, there's a lot that is involved in all this, but I really want us to be clear that God did not make man and then went, oh, he's going to need some help. Let's just make a woman. She's secondary. She's second class. She's weak. She's vulnerable. He's strong. He's clear. No, we each have our own strengths and weaknesses, but God knew that the kingdom needed both. And I'm going to answer that question for us because this is the question that we get asked. So the question I get asked is, again, should women be leading in the church? Do you believe that women should be leading in the church? And I would a- answer your question with a question. I know it's one of those moments, but, but just follow me for a minute. Let me ask you this. Do you believe that women should be fulfilling the Great Commission? Do you believe that women are supposed to fulfill the Great Commission? And you might say, I mean, I don't know. I've never thought of it like that. Well, let's look at Matthew 28, 18. And I brought scripture in today because I want to, again, not just quote it, but I want to read it to you. And this is Jesus sitting everybody, the disciples down, and he's teaching them. It's his la- some of his last words on earth, and he's giving them instruction. And he says, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, which is him, Jesus at that moment, and of the Holy Spirit who was coming to earth. And teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So did Jesus say specifically to men, I want you to go and baptize and make disciples? No, he does not define who it is because he's commissioning us as believers, men and women, right, on the earth to go and do the work of the the gospel. In fact, he uses these four verbs in the Great Commission to go to make disciples, to go make, baptize, and teach. Go make, baptize, and teach. But what I've seen in the church often is that we tend to split that in half. We go, yeah, as as the body of Christ, sure, we can go and, you know, we can make disciples, but, you know, baptizing, teaching, that's the male. That's, that's for them. Well, why, if Jesus was perfect, fully God, fully man, everything he said was intentional and it was God himself on earth. Don't you think that he would have taken the time to define by saying everybody should go and make disciples, but men, you are to baptize and you are to teach. I think he would have defined that, but he didn't. He left it as everybody. And so I think a lot of us think that we split the Great Commission, and yet that's really, it's really a human thing that we've done. It's not really what Jesus said, and we have to go back. In fact, he was saying it, and I love it that everybody gets to fulfill the Great Commission. Everybody, not just men and not just women, not just priests or not just pastors, not just, you know, pop. No, no, everybody. That means if you work in a salon, if you're a mom running a daycare, if you are running a corporation, if, I mean, wherever you are on the earth, you have been ordained and anointed to fulfill the Great Commission. And without you, we do not get, <laughs> we do not get the fullness of the kingdom. We need you. And so this idea that only certain people can lead actually divides and hurts our ability to fulfill the Great Commission, which is to go and make disciples. So again, when we start to divide and we start to say you can and you can't, 
what does is it gives someone superiority over it or maybe even gives them more authority, but really it's hurting our cause, which is moms, make go and make disciples of your kids, right? Men, go and make disciples of your employees, taking them and leading them. And so that's really important. So again, the, the first question I would ask you is, are we are women a part of the Great Commission? And I hope that you would say wholeheartedly because I would. I know that they are wholeheartedly a part. The question I would ask is, were women active in ministry from the early days of the church? Were women included in the early days of the church? Well, think about this. When Jesus was crucified and he was resurrected and he comes out of the grave and he ascends to heaven and then 120 of his followers, disciples and followers gather into this upper room to pray and they're waiting for the Holy Spirit. Were all those 120 men? No. The Bible says that men and women gathered and he didn't just have men filled with the Holy Spirit. No, everyone in that room was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's really important that all of us, we didn't get a portion or the feminine side of the Holy Spirit, the masculine side. No, no, we were all given the fullness of God within us to build the kingdom, right? So why is that important? Because it's not just that they received the Holy Spirit, but we find that women were preaching on the very first day of the church. Women were actually communicating and preaching to large crowds from all over the world. And how do we know this? How do we know that they were preaching uh, to men on the very first day of the church? Well, it's interesting because Peter in Acts chapter two, he felt obligated to explain that it wasn't going to be just a male dominated experience, but it was gonna be everybody. It was different than the Old Testament that they were not just ordaining men like Levi from the tribe, you know, the tribe of Levi, like of the priests. But Peter was explaining that everybody was going to get involved. Everybody got it. In fact, he quotes Joel, right? The book of Joel in Acts chapter two. And he says this in the last days, um, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. He doesn't say men. He doesn't say women. He doesn't say the ordained, the pastor. No, no the priest. He says, all people, your sons and your daughters. So clearly they needed a little definition (laughs) because he said, Hey, you're, I said all people, but then you might be editing it. So let me just give you it really clear. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Okay. That's everybody in the room. And then they go, well, you know, is that everybody? And then he goes, wait, your young men will see visions. And then he goes, Hey, but all the old, all of you old people, you're not, you're not X'd out either. He said, your old men will dream dreams even on my servants, both men and women. I mean, again, he's just clarifying it. I love it. He's like, every time you start checking the box of uh, all people, that's the men, you know, your sons and daughters. Okay, so it's not just those that are mature and well-developed and uh, of age, or it's not just, uh, you know, the young men that have a purpose and a vision. No, it's also the mature, the older men and women will also have this grace. And then he goes, even on your servants. And then he says it again, on men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will what? They will prophesy. They will speak on my behalf. They will lead on my behalf. They will pray on my behalf. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs on the earth below. Can I just say something? Some of us want to lead, but there are others of us that don't want to lead. And so a lot of us, might be going, you know, well, what about women? Well, I think there's another portion of us that feel like we get a pass that if we kind of experience this, well, men get to lead and women just need to submit and be quiet and be in the background, then we don't really have to show up as disciples. We don't have to show up. We can just serve and submit. But really the great commission is that you take your life seriously, that you show up in full force, that you understand that you are a critical part to the kingdom of God and what he's building on the earth. And that takes responsibility and that takes a maturity and and a leadership, not just to those in the world, but a leadership of you to say, you have to show up in full force as a woman on the earth. And you're called to prophesy and you're called to dream dreams and you're called to speak the words of God. And you're called to watch the signs and wonders that are going to follow when you do this. That is huge. Some of you go, well, you know, I don't know what God has for me. I don't know what he's called me to do. The Great Commission, that is the call on all of our lives. 
And for some of you, you're so busy trying to define something different. And yet really he's saying, this is what we're called to. And so, yes, we believe that obviously there's a huge role for women in the kingdom. And obviously women were preaching the gospel even in the beginning. In fact, a lot of people have asked the question, you know, well, what role did women have in spreading the gospel? And I talked about it, but the first Christian sermon was preached by a woman. She preached it to the apostles, an all male group in the book of John chapter 20. And we see this over and over. You know, God tells Anna, who is a prophet of the temple about the baby Jesus. And she starts preaching to everybody about the Messiah. I mean, we see this over and over again. Even when Jesus met the woman at the well, she goes and becomes the first evangelist, telling the whole, like her whole town, I met a man who told me everything about me. Come meet him. She was the evangelist. This is amazing. This is Jesus breaking down cultural, you know, norms and, and, and parts of, you know, uh, su- superiority. And he's saying, no, no, everybody gets to be involved. Everybody gets to be included. And so the other question I would ask is, What was the impact of the early church's ministry with women involved about uh, that actually created church growth? Because you have to understand this. We think, you know, well, you know, we want to build the church. We want to reach the world. You know, is it men? Is it women? Should they be pastoring? Should they be preaching? Well, we have to go back to the origin. Again, like I said, when we want to know that what we're doing is pure, we want to know that it's what God designed, then the best thing we do is we go back. We go back to how Jesus lived. We go back to what he taught the disciples. We get our red letters out and we say, what did Jesus say? And that gives us a purity to like a baseline, right? Well, when we look at this, if you go back to the beginning church, the very early church, we find out that for the first 300 years, first 300 years of the church, From 120 people that had a revival the first day when Peter got up and preached and 3,000 were added, we found that that alone, in the first 300 years, the church exploded. The early church grew. I mean, they were baptizing. They were making disciples. And it was going from nation to nation and region to region. I mean, it was, and it's the reason we're sitting here today is because of what happened in those first 300 years. So why is that important? Because... We, back then, they didn't say, you have to go to Bible school and then get your four-year degree and then make sure that you have your certificate and then you can baptize. And then, you know, if you want to actually make disciples, well, you better go through ministry school so that you can turn around and lead people well and make sure you're a healthy leader. Sure, these things have been helpful. Yes, we want to be more effective. So we want ministry schools and we want mission schools and we want to grow in our theology and understanding. Yes, yes, yes. But that's not... That doesn't change the core, which is the commission, which is the great commission. And in those days, everybody participated. Everybody. They didn't say, well, the pastor preaches, teaches, you know, prays for people, baptizes people, and I just, I invite people to church. No, in fact, there are very, there are multiple churches, even in America currently, that if you actually lead someone to the Lord, you're the one to baptize them. Because that was how the early church did it. If you led someone to the Lord, you baptized them. You you prayed for the filling of the Holy Spirit. You took them from the beginning all the way through till they became disciples of, of you, but then became be, began to disciple others. So this is the origin of which we were we came from. This is the early church. So do I believe that women had a critical role when it came to the early church? Absolutely. And it's not just my idea. We see them, I mean, First of all, Jesus decides to enter earth in the womb of a woman. I don't know what is more countercultural than for him not to come out of, you know, a palace and enter the world. No, no. He says, I'm going to come into, into the womb of a woman so that no one is confused about the value of a woman and what she brings. I'm going to actually, when I leave the tomb, the very first people that I'm going to find, the very first gender, are going to be women. They're going to find me, they're going to see me, and they're going to tell the world that I'm alive. I'm going to tell a woman who has multiple husbands, who's hiding in the midday, right, drink, bringing water. I'm going to tell her, and I'm going to, I'm going to make her a, for the first evangelist. I mean, we just see it over and over. In the middle of all these prestigious men and this male-only experience, he lets a woman who has is to been disgraced, who, who everybody knows what she's done, who she is, a prostitute. He lets her come in and pour perfume on his feet and wash it with her tears. 
because he was an advocate of women. He understood the value that without women in the culture, they would be missing who Christ is, who he is in fullness. So wherever you are, you have to understand that if you are not including women, you are not acting like Jesus because Jesus was including women. If you believe that men are superior to women, then you are not acting like Jesus because Jesus did not believe that men were superior to women. Now, does that mean we are the same? No, we are equally valuable. We have equal authority in the spirit, but we each have unique uh, uh, elements. I want to say characteristics. We each have unique roles in the kingdom to build it in a healthy way. I am going to be a woman to my sons, just like their dad is going to be a man to their boys. There is unique characteristics of femininity and unique characteristics of masculinity, not just our culture, but actually what God has created them to do. Why would God allow a woman to only give birth? Why would God allow men to even physically be built strong? There are roles, right? A man's role in the Bible talks about being a provider, a protector, right? And a woman's role is to nurture, is to build life, to create life. So there are different roles. I, I don't want us to get mixed up on that. But I, core, the core level is should women be leading in the church? I don't know. Are there unbelievers on the earth? Uh, yeah. So I guess we need all hands on deck, right? We need everybody in, in their strength building the kingdom of God. And that's where I want to start. Because a lot of us go, well, what about them being a pastor? Pastoring is like eight rows down. We got to start at the first row, which is every woman and every man in full force leading their life, making disciples and going and telling the world about the gospel. And then lastly, the, the last question is what biblical examples show that women can be involved in ministry and leadership roles? Well, again, we don't just see women washing Jesus's feet and serving him a meal and just quietly just behind the scenes. No, we see women. Anna is preaching, right? We have women that were uh, funding the, the, the Paul apostle. We, we find them funding the kingdom. Uh, they were apostles. They were prophets. They were pastors. Women were in all five roles. And we see this from the very beginning of, of the, in, in the New Testament, we see women taking leading roles. And honestly, in the Old Testament, you don't think Esther didn't have a apostolic leading role in that moment to save her people? You don't think that Deborah wasn't a in the prophetess role leading the people? Absolutely. We see this over and over. So why what, what's most important? Again, this is not an in-depth theological going through every scripture, although we could. The goal here is when we're going to talk about women in leadership in this series, my goal is is to at least start with the baseline of women. We have value. We are equally, uh, we have equal opportunity in the kingdom to be anointed, to lead in leadership. We are not trying to be men. We are women and we are going to lead. And if we can't lead ourselves and we can't lead other women, I don't know if we should be leading men. And I really say that in, in a kind way, but there should be a part of us that has favor with our with women as a woman and just as men should have favor with men before they lead men or women so again that's a havilism but that's what i i really believe so what's the goal the goal is we're not on the defense when it comes to being women in leadership i don't have to defend my role i don't have to say well i'm supposed to be here and i have value no my the bible says you will know them by their fruit and so I'm not going to say I'm a leader and, you know, I, I prophesy and I preach and I do all these discipleship things. No, you can see the fruit in my life. You can see the prophetic words that come to pass. You can see uh, the people that lives have been changed by uh, the, the things that God has allowed me to preach or teach or whatever. And so if someone says, well, what about, do you believe this? Then you should be able to say, well, then look at my fruit because that is a representation, the purity that what you're saying really does have action to back it up. So when we talk about women in leadership, a label isn't going to make you a leader. I'm sorry. You saying pastor, I'm now a pastor. Well, a, the, in, the, in, in scripture, the label is only given to the function. So if you're a leader as a woman, you're already leading and then they are, acknowledge that. 
And that's how the kingdom has worked. So you'll be set apart. You see it in scripture, even Jesus did that, or that early early uh, disciples, uh, when Jesus left and they had to ordain a couple more um, uh, leaders and disciples. And yeah, they, they actually saw they were already working in the kingdom and then they took them and they acknowledged it and they elevated them in that position. So if you're saying, I want to be a woman in leadership, then I would say to you, lead, lead. And how do I lead? Serve. And how do I serve? I serve where there's impact, there's discipleship, and the great commission is being fulfilled on the earth around you. And it will be undeniable. There is, let me tell you, maybe in America, we don't have as many women leading in these specific roles. But when you get into the church that is undercover and they are the ones that um, the underground church in China and different places you will find that it does not matter if it's male or female they just need all hands on deck and I'm believing this I'm believing that in revival in revival we will need everybody participating and maybe the enemy's great plan is to get us to question our own value in the in our faith and in the kingdom so that half of us right or even more than half of us say oh I can't do that and maybe that's even part of his device to get us to, to play small rather than saying, we're ready. We're ready. We will go and do what Jesus says to do. We'll do. And when he says, go, we go. And so I'm hoping in this series that we, we're going to have more conversational things. But my heart for the beginning of this series was to just set, set a baseline and set a mission and a big picture around it. So that way, as we go into these conversations, you even as a man listening to this or watching this can say, okay, I know why I have women leading in my environment. I understand the value because if Jesus valued it, so do I. And that's where I hope again, he is, he is fully God. We are not. And he is the great example, the purest example of that, which we're called to. So I hope that you, you enjoyed this today. I hope you got something out of it. Maybe for some of you, it, it got you thinking about it. You'd never really thought of it this way. I would just ask maybe, Leave us a question or leave us a comment or review. Let us know if this speaks to you or if we can answer a question that you still have about this topic. Throw it in our DMs. Let us know. I We'll do our best to answer those. And if nothing else, I want you to know that if you have not been seen or believed in or you've been shut out or benched, that is not how God feels about you. That is not what he came to do. And so it's time to get back in the game. It's time to begin to see yourself as Jesus saw you as a valuable, fully empowered, fully prepared, fully positioned to build the kingdom alongside every person that you're around. All right, you guys, I love you. I hope this helps. Next week, we're going to talk more about women in leadership. And uh, if nothing else, I'll see you next time.